Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're joined by, by Ben, uh, who is uh, the group chief economist and also deputy director of public affairs for Vodafone. Thanks for joining us again. Um, ben, here in Europe, we love talking about the importance of connectivity as a driver for, for growth and for, for jobs. And yet, when it comes to digital infrastructure, when it comes to you know, connectivity issues, we still have a lot of problems here, here in Europe. Zooming out, what's your assessment when it comes to the rollout of digital infrastructure in Europe? Where's the where are the bottlenecks? And is this only a question about money and investment, or there is something more to it? So, thank you. A big question. Um, and uh, the last session of the evening, so I know I'm standing between everyone and what they really want to get to. But no, I, I, just to clarify, on dig digital infrastructure, really the part I'll answer is the bit which we really care about, where we're we're famous for, which is the connectivity layer within a much broader digital ecosystem. And from our perspective, we, we are seeing Europe gradually losing its place in the world. Um, we, we've had a history of being you know, innovators at the head of the game, and now we are, we are concerned that actually we are falling behind. Um, and whether we look at um, benchmarks which the ERT produces, whether we look at external um, evidence from OpenSignal, done a big study on where, where do you have 5G in different countries in the world, and, and there's no European country in the top 10 countries of the world. And that's, that is a start to be a concern for us. Um, and we, th we firmly believe that Europe needs to regain um, its edge on connectivity. Um, but we see major bottlenecks. And I would pla place the bottlenecks on in two aspects, um, two Cs, in fact. Um, one is consistency and one is coherence. Um, and so within consistency, we, we struggle as an, op as an operator. We're present in you know, 10 member states. Um, we have partner markets in across every other member state apart from one. Um, yet, we have a very different regulatory framework in every member state we operate in. We, we have a huge potential of a scaled single market, yet we are simply not able to generate the, the benefits of that single market due to the, the lack of consistency across member states. Um, and really, if we want to roll out a, a new network, we cannot roll out a single European network. We have to requirements which mean we have to locate bits of equipment everywhere that we operate. And that's a real barrier to the single market, which could drive so much more scale, so much more um, reward for European companies, and therefore so much more investment driving the European competitiveness that we, that we believe we really need. The second part of, of consistency is within this digital ecosystem. We are, unfortunately, from our perspective, we are a part of the ecosystem that has had a history of very extreme intervention. Um, we have a, had a whole framework of telecoms regulation explicitly set up just to regulate one part of this ecosystem. And we've lost track of this overall ecosystem where there is competition between different elements and competition that should flourish. We're firm believers in the market doing its magic and driving good outcomes for, for consumers. Um, and yet we find there's one element, one part which is heavily um, policed. Um, we always say we, we have these um, huge um, artificial um, we have these artificially low barriers to entry, lots of new entrants brought into the market on favorable terms, discriminatory terms. We have these huge barriers to exit from a merger point of view, huge conditions applied any time the market wants to get to a more consistent and more efficient um, structure. And then when we're in there, we are sort of plucked. Um, you know, spectrum policy being used to extract huge value from the industry where in other parts of our spectrum is being used to drive value, not just extract value. So we'll have this lack of consistency where we've got one part of the ecosystem which is heavily policed, um, which, is, which is then causing us a slowdown, as we've seen with the external benchmarks, on the deployment of infrastructure. And then on the coherent side, and I think we, we'll, you'll touch on this um, a little bit later on, but um, that there we have lots of different pieces of legislation sort of tacked onto each other. I think the European institutions did a fantastic job when they put the European Elec Electronic Communications Code of bringing together disparate pieces of policy into one single coherent piece. And that was the right thing. They brought together some elements of spectrum policy, some elements of access policy, and some elements of consumer policy, and said, right, we need to make these things coherent. What's happened in the intervening period is we've had many other elements of policy which have started to impact on us as a sector. Much more interventionist security policy, for, as an example. We haven't really cracked a merger policy. And the result is we have this incoherence between where we want to get to, digital decade targets, which we strongly support, and different pieces of policy which don't come together as a cohesive whole to drive us towards the end game that we really, which we really aspire to. 
These are, these are extremely good points and very sober reminders, Ben, because um, you know, here in the think tank community, there, it's very easy to give out the policy recommendations of just upgrade a single market and make sure we have enough infrastructure. But you know, here, here is a, a big European company reminding us that we have market fragmentation, we have lots of problems when it comes to legislation, and it's not that easy. Um, you touched upon 5G, um, and I want to close the topic on the infrastructure with, with, with 5G. Do we see the same problems um, when it comes to 5G rollout, because Europe hasn't been that much of a success case in the last couple of years when it comes to 5G deployment. Yeah, and this, it, this is the heart of the problem in our opinion. We are, we are behind on 5G, we have less connections on 5G, we have less availability of 5G, and the prognosis is not good. The prognosis is not healthy. It's a sector which, if you look at the financial performance of the sector, the return on capital of the sector is below the cost of capital, and this is unsustainable. The, the sector has a huge amount of debt. We all know what's happened in the capital markets in the last you know, 12 to 18 months, where as a result of external factors, the, the, the cost of debt and the cost of therefore all financing has gone up. There isn't endless capital available. And the ability for, for us to invest in a step change technology, because that's what 5G is. And let's be clear that there are different flavors of 5G. So you can get a basic 5G, which gives you a, a 5G signal on your phone, might say 5G, and you get a, something of a speed boost. But the real magic in 5G comes in what we call 5G standalone, and apologies for being a bit technical at this time of day. Please do. Uh, but 5G standalone utilizes both a much, much uh, more enhanced core network infrastructure, sort of the computing at the core, and much, much better spectrum at the edge of the network. You put those two together, and not only do you get more capacity, um, which means when your phone previously said it was 50 megabits per second, now it might say 100, it'll say 600, 700 megabits per second. But you get two additional benefits. One is you can just connect many, many more devices. So the, 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 our, our network will be able to connect billions of devices simultaneously. And that's when you get into a really exciting mesh network of every device connected, every device creating data, making processes more efficient. And then you get the third benefit, which is what we call latency, the ability for the network to react in absolute real time. And you put these three things together, and what you have is from today where we have a 4G, sort of early 5G world, which is great for consumers, driving exciting things. Everyone knows the apps we use on our phone, they, they dominate our daily lives. We'll get to the same situation for businesses. Every European business will be dependent on this highly connected, billions of devices, low latency services, which will, which will revolutionize manufacturing, or revolutionize healthcare, or revolutionize the way we get public services. But we won't get that benefit unless we are able to actually, as an industry, invest in this 5G infrastructure, which is expensive, and where we're finding the capital markets are, are more constrained than they were in the past. So there needs to be a coherent and cohesive policy approach. Say, we have digital decade targets, we've signed up to them as a company, we think they're the right things, and maybe not even ambitious enough. We might find that we get to 2030, we've hit the digital dec decade targets, and we're still trading in the US, we're still trading China, and that's something we need to be mindful of in the next seven years. But we're not even going to get to the digital decade targets without having a really honest approach to get the overall framework, how we as a sector need to be pol policed in a positive way to get to those digital decade targets. Otherwise, we will continue to lag behind and we'll be rolling out 5G when the rest of the world is rolling out 6G. Very quick question, um, and then we'll move on competitiveness. Um, the question of security, when we mm -hmm. talk about 5G and we talk about digital infrastructure. Because in the last couple of years, there's been intense dialogue of the threats involved when it comes to 5G specifically. It's not only uh, a hardware issue, it's also a software issue. Which company uh, maintains your network? Which company does the patches? Where does the data go through and all that? And especially in the UK, there's been a lovely, uh, lively debate on this one. And the, the European Commission came out with its own uh, toolbox on, on 5G, saying that we should not use untrusted vendors. How is this experience going for Vodafone when it comes to replacing infrastructure? So, f firstly, say we, we do support, obviously, the sovereign right of every member state to make its decision on, on security. It's a critical um, um, decision that they have to make, and, and we respect that right. We've been working with every member state we operate in on security matters since the day we started our business. Um, and, but then, when it comes to this specific topic of high-risk vendors, firstly, we've been proactive in doing certain things um, on our own. So, we announced a couple of years ago we would be taking out high-risk vendors from the core part of our network, the more sensitive parts. Um, but what, what we're really asking for is, and in, in full support of what the European Commission has, has said on the security toolbox, is a risk-based, evidence-based approach, so that w where there is risk, then it, it is dealt with. But then I go back to my previous comment on, on the need for coherence. 
when, when this is an additional element of policy layered onto an already highly regulated um, sector, something else has to give. And so it, it is a right and, a, and appropriate to make decisions on security, but they're not taken in a vacuum, and something has to change. So the question is, what has to change? And here there's not that many options. So on the one hand, you could say, well, let's just accept that if it's going to be more expensive now to replace old equipment um, and have less vendor choice because we have um, certain vendors we can't use, then maybe we have to scale back the ambition on the digital decade targets, not something that we, we would propose. Or we need to find other policy levers. There's other policy levers which maybe can bring more financial oxygen into the sector, different approaches to spectrum, different approaches to market structure. And then there's also how do we create more vendor diversity um, to ensure that the risk from one less or a few less choices on um, from a high-risk vendor perspective are replaced with something else. And here we see Open RAN, where we're making huge progress on Open RAN, but where we found that the European institutions have been way behind other parts of the world, the UK, the US, India especially, are really getting behind Open RAN as they see it as the future of um, more competitive networks, um, more efficient networks, but also a way to have greater supply chain diversity. These are the things that need to change, and probably all of them need to change in, in, in combination to compensate for where member states uh, do to start make decisions on security to, to remove high-risk vendors from certain parts of the network. And if all else fails, then there's always the option for public money in the form of compensation to ensure that we don't lose the, uh, the path that we need to be on, which is towards those digital decade targets. Digital decade as a, as a final point, and you are the chief economist. I want to pick your brain on this one. How do we address and how do we achieve those digital decade goals? Uh, there's, you know, there's need of investment, need of policy, legislation. If you can focus on two very important points when it comes to either achieving those targets or boosting competitiveness or the digital intensity in SMEs, you name it, which two or three points would you, would you address in a nutshell for achieving these, these targets? That's a, yeah, that's a, there's, if I could just do it down to two or three, then that's a, a magic formula. Um, like I said, firstly, it is addressing the investment climate. We just have to have a pro-investment mindset in Europe, and that goes back to, I'll repeat it until um, I, <laughs> you all will fall asleep, but we just have to have this coherence around what do we want to get to, and if we want to get to a certain place, then every decision needs to be taken with that, that in mind. I mean, we, we find it bizarre that there is a sort of a two to three year framework for assessing a merger in relation to what happens to prices is instead of a six year, 10 year horizon in assessing a merger in terms of what happens to investment and what's that mean for consumer welfare. So it's really saying if that's where we want to get to, every policy decision, every regulatory decision, every com competition decision needs to be viewed through the lens of what, what our end point we need to achieve is. And then I, I think, I, it, again, I, I repeat it, it's the, it's, the, it's the need for coherence. Um, but coherent and, and consistency, but the, uh, really then the single market. If we, we, you can fix all the individual problems of, you know, what, you know, do we need to have a better approach for spectrum? Do we need to have a better approach for, for security? But if we're not utilizing the full benefit of a single market, we're, we're not going to achieve what Europe can achieve. And it, it's really, it's a shame that, I mean, we are an example of this. Major European operators in the last five, 10 years have all retrenched from their previously very expansive pan-European ambitions to being much less pan-European. This is a statement of fact. We've, we've had to exit some markets. Deutsche Telekom, Orange, Telefonica, the four biggest operators in Europe, all have to exit markets. This is not the trend we want to see continuing, and there has to be a policy approach that says, how do we get the benefit of the single market? How do we ensure that we get scale in the connectivity layer to bring the, the, the broader benefit for other European companies to really get the benefit from the connectivity the, the automated factories, the new processes, which will make European companies more competitive in the world in a sort of a, a collaborative ecosystem, which at the moment we're going to have a, an ecosystem where we're going to suffer from the weakest link, which unfortunately will be, will be the connectivity layer. Fantastic. A, a good reminder about the importance of, of a true digital single market and coherence when it comes to European policy. Ben Reschner from Chief Economist at Vodafone, it's been a pleasure. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much.